you're tempted to click away. You're tempted to click away, aren't you? Why? Why? No fancy intros, no uh, special effects, no state-of-the-art equipment, quick transitions, eye-grabbing edits. Are you really that superficial? You're better than that. You're better than that. Give this video a chance. With that being said, welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content, and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry, and before we go any further, click on that subscribe button on the lower right-hand corner. Then we could all move on with our lives and enjoy the rest of this video. Today I have another top 10 list for you guys. Actually, it's a correction, it's a top five list for you guys. And it's my top five Days of Wonder board games. These are games published under the line of Days of Wonder games. Now, Days of Wonder has more than five board games. Um, at the same time, they don't have an extensive catalog of, you know, hundreds of games or even several dozens of games. They have a few dozen games, I guess, or more or less in their catalog. I've happened, I've happened to only play five of them, and that's why I'm only making a top five. But I enjoy all five of these games quite a lot, so I don't feel like I'm cheating anybody by only making a top five. So, without any further ado, let's move on to my top five. Starting off with my number five, and that is this one here, Small World. And for some people, this will be their number one. As a matter of fact, I feel like all five of them will have people out there who for them is particularly number one. But for me, it's just made it to their number five. This is an area control game that accommodates to the player count. So basically, it has different player boards, double-sided boards, that adjust to the amount of players. So you use a certain board for two players, a certain board for three, four, and five. And each of them have balanced configurations of the different terrain types and an equivalent amount of terrains that would still keep the feeling of the, the theme, small world, the tightness of the map, but at the same time get a little bit bigger to accommodate higher player counts. This game is a really, really neat game. It still plays very well at two, although, you know, usually area control, area majority games play better in higher player counts. And of course, this does too, but it still works perfectly fine at two because you're just trying to have sole possession of a certain territory. You're not trying to have um, more, more, you know, units there than your opponents. You just want to have all the units there because that's what happens. You take over and you conquer all these lands. What's interesting about this game is that each player is going to have a particular player race combined with a particular special power. And the race and the power each give you special benefits, special abilities that are unique to you, and combine uh, very well with one another. And the thing is, there's about 17 different races or something like that, another like 15 different powers. So there's a lot of different um, combinations, um permutations that you can find throughout the game of all these different races and powers and what's interesting is there is no way you're going to make it through the whole game with that one race eventually your race because you only have a certain amount of tiles that represent your units eventually they start to thin out they start to dwindle down and you have to put that race into decline which means you lose whatever special powers it gives you it still has a limited and weak albeit presence on your board and little by little they will be picked off but and but you completely lose your special abilities and now you draft a new special race and ability combination really really cool pulling that trigger knowing when to decline and you know when you don't want to decline too late you also don't want to decline too early you want to milk each race that you draft for what it's worth that that interesting tense decision is the heart of the game it's the crux of the game now I love the, the drafting mechanism because you have a row of, you know, um, special powers and races. And the higher they are in the row, the cheaper they are. The lower they are in the row, the more you have to spend. So you might luck out and you might get an amazing, you know, race and ability combined higher up on the row. Get them for real cheap, maybe even for free. Or you might find a race and... Uh, and um, power combo that is too hard to pass by and you say you know what it's worth three coins i'm gonna pay for it and what you do is you place each of those one of each of those coins on each of the rows above it right so eventually those races even if they're a little weaker 
are become a little bit more tempting because when you draft them, not only do you get the race, their units, and all their special abilities, but you also get the coins that are on top. So that really balances things out very well. Fun game. Again, I said it plays well on all player counts because the maps accommodate for that. This is my number five Days of Wonder board game of all time, Small World. And with that being said, we move on to my number four. My number four is right here, Ticket to Ride. Again, many people's number one, perhaps. And this is a polarizing game in a way because it's a little bit older. It's almost 20 years old. And uh, it's a Spiel des Jahres winner. And it's a gateway game, especially when you're just playing the base game. And some people, you know, have moved on from that and so on and so forth. Me, I love this game. This is still one of my favorite games of all time. I'll admit, obviously, as the games, as I move further and further into my gaming experience, further away from my gateway, you know, initiations, yes, this game starts to go down on my list, but it still has a solid spot because I love what all the different map expansions have. And I keep all of my content, at least my open content, because I have tons of even more unopened content. I keep all my open content in these three boxes, the Europe, the Nordic countries, and the base box here. I have tons of maps. I own every imprint expansion for this game, and I've played maybe half of them. I own the small city versions that are coming out recently in recent years very excited about the amsterdam one that's coming out later on this year this game is fun i love geography that's personally something that you know scratches an itch for me and my wife loves traveling so i feel that this is a game that kind of feeds us mutually because of our interests although i'm not as into traveling as she is and she's not as into geography as i am but there is some overlap there, right? And we have lots of fun as this game transports us into these different lands. And it's a simple, you know, set collection game where you're using those sets of different colored cards to build routes that correspond with the number and colors of the cards you're playing. Really, really, really cool. You know, learning a new map and the new nuances that each map introduces because it's not just a different geographical setup, right? Because you're in Europe or Africa or Asia. It's also that Alan Moon, designer Alan Moon, adds a little wrinkle to each game. Nothing to reinvent the wheel, nothing to totally throw you off either. Nothing that's going to make you agonize over the rule book for several hours to pick up and learn and reinforce. No, it's always something very subtle, very simple, but at the same time very intricate and neat that makes this map different from the other map, which is why I always am excited to explore and start up a new expansion or, or a new map. This game, again, lots of fun. Hours and hours of fun I've had with this game. This is definitely a game that I try to introduce to people. I will admit it's not everybody's cup of tea. And it won't always work for a gateway game. Because it is a little bit dull and a little bit boring. You kind of have to know the personality type of the people that you might use this with as a gateway game. If the person is the kind of person that needs that, you know, exciting stimulus to keep them interested. To keep them focused. To keep their attention then this, is, this might not be the game for them. You might want to find a more action-packed, action-oriented type of game. However, if a person has a more passive personality, it's possible that they will enjoy this game and that would be an excellent gateway into the board game hobby for them. Either way, casual gamers, hardcore gamers, lots of people love this game. This is my number four Days of Wonder board game of all time, Ticket to Ride. And now we move on to my number three. And this is another game that I have lots of content for. That is one thing about Days of Wonder. When they get behind their games, they get behind their games and support them with lots of content. My number three Days of Wonder game is Memoir 44. And right here I have two of these boxes. First of all, I bought both of these boxes so I could play Overlord, which is a way of combining two player boards to make a huge, because this is typically a two versus two player game, uh, War Simulation you know, light war simulation of World War II. However, um, when you combine the two boards, you can play all the way up to four versus four. And it works very, very well. Now, unfortunately, I've only been able to play Overlord one time. It was hard to, you know, gather up people. I actually scheduled an event with eight people to play four and four. And even so, well, we, we ended up playing three on three because two of the people were not able to make it. So, you know, go figure, right? But it was a phenomenal game. One player's the commander, the other players, um, or the overlord, I should say, the other players are generals underneath him or her taking orders. You know, there's imperfect communication going on. 
and sometimes just trusting and delegating your generals and seeing how they execute your orders. Really, really neat, really fun. But at a two-player game, it is very tactical, very back and forth. Um, I love the card system here. You know, this is basically from a bigger system of games called the Commands and Colors games. Basically indicating the two things. You have commands and you have different colors or different units. In this case, they're all the same color. Different units that do different things. They move a different way. They attack a different way. They roll a different amount of dice. And, and just mechanically speaking, they give you different options. But you have your cards. You have this hand management where the cards tell you what units you can order in what section you can order and what they can do. And sometimes they might be able to do a little bit extra if the card so indicates. Really, really neat. At the same time, sometimes you could be a prisoner of a bad hand, but that's a challenge, right? And it's kind of almost thematic. In war, things don't always go your way. So you have to be able to adapt and be able to, you know, modify on the fly, you know, uh, ad lib or improvise your you know, game plan as the game progresses. Really, really cool. Sometimes you get really frustrated when you have the cards. There's dice rolling, but even the dice rolling is so strategic because you have to know which units to attack because there are some units that are more vulnerable to attack. So there's more sides on the die that represent that unit. So they're more likely to die in an attack than some of the other units. So you need to, sometimes you got to pick between two units and you got to say, well, this unit is more devastating, yes, but this unit is more vulnerable. And ultimately, you win by ca killing a certain amount of units entirely. And this is a scenario-based game. I love how each of the scenarios is based on an actual historical battle. And Richard Borg, the designer of this game, gives you a little bit of a synopsis of what happened historically, who won that battle, all the terrain features, because you do set up a board with different terrain features that are indicative of how that battle or where that battle was originally fought. And all those terrain features limit, hinder, or help your units in different ways. A lot of attention to historical detail. I personally am a huge fan of history. I love the way this game is implemented. This is the easiest of the Command & Colors games to introduce to a new gamer or a casual gamer. It looks beautiful. The miniatures look beautiful. The board looks beautiful. The cards look beautiful. Tons of content that I own. Some that I've opened, some that I have not. A fun game. I cannot say enough about this game. My number three, Days of Wonder Board Game of All Time, Memoir 44. And now we move to the real cream of the crop, my top two Days of Wonder board games. And first, we have my number two, Shadows Over Camelot, designed by Bruna Cathala and Ludovic Mablanc. This is one of the older and original cooperative board games. This board game is responsible I would say directly for games like Battlestar Galactica, any board game that has somewhat of a traitor in it, because this, tra this game kind of innovated that traitor mechanism where one or more players are secret traitors pretending to be part of the team, but really with ulterior motives and ultimately trying to make you fail so that they can win. Really cool King Arthur themed game. Um, uh, the, mecha the, the mechanics and the theme don't necessarily mean much you're just playing cards you're going to different areas which represent different quests or missions and you're going there sometimes collectively as a group sometimes individually by yourself and you're playing certain cards and trying to meet the the uh, requirements of the different quests and what i love about this game is you're supposed to have no communication about the details of your cards some people find a way to cheat and bend that rule and tweak it you know, the people I play with, we don't, we respect that rule absolutely because it's part of the challenge of the game. And also it really leaves open the possibility of the trader because you have no idea who has what and we don't know who the trader might be based on how he plays or she plays their cards. Really cool game. I love the production quality, the little miniatures. They didn't need to be miniatures. They could have been meeples or whatever. Uh, standees, plastic standees. No, this is great. Cardboard standees, I should say. This was miniatures. Nice detailed miniatures for each of King Arthur or his Knights of the Round Table pieces. And each character, by the way, also has a special ability that makes him or her different from the others. And what's really neat is that each round you make a, on your turn, you make a progression of evil decision where you decide how to progress evil in one way or another. And there's so many ways that evil, evil could progress. But preferably, if you can, you want to take a hit to your life, right? Each player actually has a life. And uh, it starts at four, but it could go all the way up to six. You want to take a hit because by taking a hit, 
you take all the brunt of the blow individually, and the rest of the players are not affected by the other ways in which you could progress evil. And that's a way of showing loyalty, and, you know, it's a way that, you know, the um, um, traitor may or may not be deciphered or may or may not be revealed based on their willingness to be sacrificial, to take one for the team. Really, really cool. Um, love going on the different missions, trying to trying to accomplish it. Love being the traitor and trying to remain undercover and just do just enough to convince the players that I'm on their side. But when the moment's right, you know, show my true colors and just unleash on them so much fury that they have no chance of winning. Um, this game is really hard. I find it to be very hard. I think I don't think we've ever won. You know, I play this mostly with my nephews and my niece. That I can think of, I don't think we ever won. If we won, it's definitely at most one time. Um, the traders tend to be really, really good at this game. We play with the possibility of a trader too. Because that's there's different ways of playing. We play with the possibility of traders. So there may not actually be a trader, And you might be falsely accusing people the whole game for nothing. And that throws you off uh, terribly. So this is my favorite cooperative game of all time. I absolutely love it. And it's my number two Days of Wonder board game. Shadows over Camelot. And finally, that's it. The King of the Hill, the number one Days of Wonder board game of all time, at least in my opinion. I'm sure lots of people will agree. I I, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is ranked number one on BGG, on BoardGameGeek.com, out of all Days of Wonder games. If I'm wrong, I'm sure you will correct me. My number one Days of Wonder board game, Five Tribe, designed by Bruno Cathala. This game is absolutely amazing. This is one of the few games in my collection that I will give a 10 out of 10 to. Um, I feel like I have lots of games that I'll give a 9.5. And yes, I do decimals and maybe even a 9.7. I'm that specific sometimes. But there's maybe six, seven, maybe 10 games that I give a perfect 10 to. And this is one of them because it is gorgeous first of all from a production quality even by days of wonder standards it is a gorgeous game the pieces here are amazing the meeples are nice and colorful colorful and they blend in with the player board tiles the, the board tiles here so well and even the art on these board these tiles here is so beautiful i absolutely love it and it lends itself to that arabian theme right and even the score uh, scoring pad here is absolutely gorgeous, nice and thick, very generous with the score sheets. The cards here are really nice. The resources that you get throughout the game, really, really, really nice. You've got the different gins or genies that are available that you'll be drafting throughout the game. There's a lot going on in this game, and I actually like how it all gels uh, with each other, right? All these different gins that give you, first of all, they give you victory points, and then they also give you special abilities, either one-time abilities or per permanent abilities, depending on which one. And some of them cost you more, but give you something, you know, relatively weak as far as an ability is concerned. Others, you know, they they give you less victory points, but give you an amazing ability. Uh, really, really cool. You have some beautiful, chunky pieces right here. Chunky wooden pieces. You've got the oasis trees right here to represent your oases, which score you points. You have the palaces right here. Look at that. Nice and chunky wooden piece. Each player has their own camels in their different respective colors, right? You use those camels to indicate that you have control of a tile, right? There's some area control in this game. Really, really neat. Even your... Player order pieces are nice little pillars. Very chunky pillars. Really, really cool. I cannot say enough. And the player aids are very thorough and specific. So you know all the different gins, all the different things that the meeples give, do for you. This is a month. I haven't even started explaining the, the mechanisms of this game. I've just gone on and on about the production because the production is phenomenal. But the gameplay is phenomenal too. Bruno Cathala basically took a old and classic um, board game mechanism, Mancala, which is basically when you where you grab a set of items and you move it across a board 
and space by space you're dropping off one of those items into each space until you finally make it to your final spot. In this game, you have the meeples that are randomly placed on your six by five, you know, board of all these different tiles. And you grab the meeples and again, the number of meeples you grab indicate how many spaces you can move throughout. And for each space, you're dropping off one of those meeples. And the last meeple that you drop off on that space, there needs to be at least one, if not more meeples that match the same color of that meeple. And if you do, you collect those meeples and gain whatever benefit it triggers because each of the different colors gives you a different special bonus, a special way of benefiting from it during the game. Really, really cool. And then on top of it all, each tile also gives you a special benefit when you end your turn on it. So you can combo these moves very, very well. I love the fact that this is something that Bruno Cathala has implemented in other games. He's done it in Kekladis. To some extent, he does it in King Domino, where you are kind of like buying and bidding. You're literally bidding in this case with money for turn order. And in a two-player game, you get two turns per round. So you can you know, manipulate the auction in a way where you have two turns in a row before your player does and set yourself up for a mega turn or a mega round in that case. Really, really neat. You're scoring because of the different tiles because once you've emptied a tile, clear a tile of all its meeples, you get to place your camel there and basically that is your tile. It's going to score you a certain amount of points for the number that's on it on the upper right hand corner plus any bonus points for any oasis trees you might add on it, for any palaces you might add on it. Really, really phenomenal. You're trying to do so many things to manage your money, manage the resources that you're getting throughout the game because you could trade these in for points and or money because, uh, or I should say, yeah, points and or money. Well, coins and or points because the coins in this game are points if you still have them at the end of the game. Or in the case of the cards, their points, period. So, again, really, really cool. All the different ways that you can score points. You might get your butt kicked in one area, but if you come back in a few others, it might be enough to get the job done. I haven't even played with any of the expansions in this game. This game has, I think, three expansions out there. I own one, but I have not opened it yet. And um, and I look forward to exploring this game more. Uh, I still haven't taught this game to my wife, which is one of the reasons why it hasn't been featured more on this channel. Because lately I have been relegated to only playing with, with my wife Lily. And I focus more on games that are new to both of us. I haven't gone back and taught her this game. But I need to teach her this game because I haven't played this game in a while. And I absolutely love this game. My number one Days of Wonder board game. A home run by Bruno Cathala. Five tribes. And that's it. Those are my top five board games from Days of Wonder. Thank you so much for taking out some time to watch this video. What are your favorite Days of Wonder games of all time? What are your favorite or what's your number one Days of Wonder game of all time? Have you played any Days of Wonder games? What Days of Wonder games are you looking forward to trying? And which ones should I try? you know, to be my next Days of Wonder game. I like to hear, hear your opinion. So, or I should say, I like to read your opinion. So please comment down below and share your thoughts with me. All right, this is Harry from When Harry Met Board Games saying everybody take care, stay safe, stay healthy, have fun gaming, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.